You know, I'm not monetized on YouTube yet, but I've at least been trying my best to not have any of my videos age restricted so they don't get buried in the algorithm. This video though might get age restricted. Good evening, my name is Dante and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I discuss strange and obscure media. Since much of what got this channel started in the first place was my Not Safe For Life album series in which I discuss disturbing music, this video is going to be a continuation of that. The particular releases I'll be discussing tonight are all random finds off of RateYourMusic.com and I specifically wanted to think outside of the box this time around. So no metal this time. No DSBM, Funeral Doom, Gore Grind, this is all completely left field shit that I never would have even thought of. Coming in at number one is My Teenage Dream Ended by Farah Abraham released in 2012. Farah Abraham is a reality TV star who became known for being on the show Pregnant at 16 and its spin-off Teen Mom, appearing on the show in 2008 and the following year. If the name didn't give it away, these are reality shows that document the lives of teenage mothers. Farrah was 17 years old and still in high school when she appeared on the show and gave birth to her daughter Sophia in 2009. If having a child at such a young age weren't already difficult enough, the child's father Derek passed away in a car accident less than two months before their daughter was born. In 2012, Farrah wrote an autobiography called My Teenage Dream Ended, in which she spoke a bit about her upbringing and her experiences of becoming a teen mother. To pair with the book, Farrah decided she also wanted to record an album as well. She would team up with a producer by the name of Frederick M. Cuevas, who she got to know through him working on dubbing for Pregnant at 16. When they entered the studio, Farrah brought in all the lyrics she had written in her diary and sang everything to a click track with no accompaniment. Even if you aren't a musician who has recorded before, I'm sure you could understand how this was a bit of an unorthodox approach. So Farrah laid down all the vocals in studio without the backing tracks, and the producer Frederick would throw a ton of auto-tune on Farrah's vocals, mix them into the backing tracks he produced, and send them to Farrah for approval. Lo and behold, this led to the completion of My Teenage Dream Ended, a 27-minute pop album to pair with Farrah's book. The music itself is an aggressive, upbeat, hyper blend of electronic and dance pop. Farrah's singing itself is a frantic, auto-tuned, off-kilter approach in which she tells the backstory of an abusive upbringing, getting pregnant as a teenager, the death of her baby's father, and the arrest of her own father, among other very dark topics. While the book would land itself at number 11 on the New York Times bestsellers list, the album had mixed responses. To most mainstream audiences and reviewers, the album was torn apart and declared some of the worst pop music ever created. However, over the years since its release, My Teenage Dream Ended began to receive positive feedback from more niche music reviewers. Some critics praised the juxtaposition of Farrah's robotic vocals and bleak lyrics over the fast-paced pop music, considering the ensemble avant-garde, experimental, or my favorite term, outsider music. When Vice interviewed Farah, they even referred to it as a critically acclaimed noise album. Their words, not mine. In short, basically the praise that My Teenage Dream Ended received was less, hey, this is a good pop album, and more so, wow, this is one of the most bizarre pieces of music ever made. In this context, I'm reminded a lot of the Shags and their album Philosophy of the World and how it garnered such a cult following specifically for all of the nuances that made it sound unorthodox and dissonant unintentionally. Since the release of the book and album, Farah has stayed in the public eye, continuing to work in the entertainment industry as a reality TV personality, adult film actress, and social media influencer. Though we probably won't be seeing her do any world tours as a singer, I can definitely say that her work as a musician is noteworthy. The next release I'll be discussing is 10,000 Chicken Symphony by Reynolds. Reynolds are an experimental rock band from Argentina formed in 1993 by drummer and vocalist Miguel Thomason. The group were known for various bizarre methods of manipulating sounds and noises to create their work, seemingly for the sake of begging the question where one draws the line between music and sound art. Their 2000 single, 10,000 Chicken Symphony, is no exception and is perhaps one of the more extreme examples of how they manipulate sound. Heads up, if you are sensitive to hearing about animal death, you're going to want to skip to the time on the screen.
Okay, to explain the concept behind this work, I will reference an interview from 2003 between Paris, Transatlantic Magazine, and two of the artists behind Reynolds, guitarists Roberto Conlazo and Anla Cortiz. To quote Anla Cortiz, one day we were eating fried chicken sandwiches and Miguel said, we can make a symphony of chicken sounds. One of Miguel's favorite phrases is, por qué non, why not? He says it all the time. It was an idea and one day we found this chicken coop run by friends of Roberto's girlfriend. Roberto Canlaza then says, we put a lot of microphones under the earth inside the feeding troughs. This is the only record in the world where all the participants were killed and eaten afterwards. Imagine 10,000 Miles Davises, 10,000 trumpeters, all dead and eaten. The release was recorded at Erdurain Chicken Coop, Entre Rios, Argentina, July 1999. Then it was mixed and processed at Mafiforo Studios in Buenos Aires that September. It was then released on 7-inch vinyl in January 2000. Side A consists of manipulated field recordings of 10,000 chickens, while side B consists of the original recordings all mixed together. To describe what you hear as simply as possible, it's a bunch of clucking and then grinding. Shrill, high-pitched, noisy grinding and then silence. With it being so many noises at once, it kind of sounds like one giant gust of wind that crescendos and then gradually fades out. If you were presented the EP without knowing what it was, you'd probably just think it were some weird noise recording. Knowing the context of what you're listening to, well, it's pretty sick and not in the fun way. Admittedly, I'm not vegetarian or vegan. I eat chicken often. I know that sort of thing can become a hot topic if I get too deep into it. What I will say is listening to this didn't exactly make me crave a KFC bucket. To make the whole thing even just a little bit more tongue-in-cheek, the 10,000 chickens are given a special thanks on the record sleeve. That is something. That is definitely something. The last album I'll be discussing tonight is a little bit more lighthearted, though I'm not quite sure I would call it a palate cleanser. I am referring to the self-titled album of a project called Nymphomatriarch, released in 2003. This was a collaborative work between two Canadian breakcore artists, Aaron Funk, also known as Venetian Snares, and Rachel Kozark, also known as Hecate. Collaborative is definitely one word we could use to describe how the music on this album was made. The duo set up a mic, recorded themselves having sex, and then manipulated the sounds into beats, tones, and samples to create an aggressive, fast-paced EDM or breakcore album. If you've played the game Cards Against Humanity before, you may remember that there is a card you can pull that says the primal, ball-slapping sex your parents are having right now. I associate that card with this album because the music is very... percussive? Lot of slapping noises there. Breaths and moans are sampled into airy ambient pieces which are a lot more atmospheric and chill than the high intensity rhythmic tracks. I was expecting the overall tone of this album to be very sexy and sensual, but it's not at all. I personally find the album to sound very anxious, manic, and unsettling. It's like watching a party scene in a movie where a character has done too many uppers or psychedelics, and they're just at the brink of starting to freak out while everybody is continuing to dance around them. I wouldn't go as far as to say it's outright scary, but there is a dissonance and abrasiveness of the compositions that make it a little uncomfortable to listen to after a while. Many of the comments I read on Rate Your Music critiqued it as being dull or meaty mediocre, with its only real notable feature being its novelty. Personally, I don't feel I am well acquainted enough with this genre or the artist involved to give a well-informed opinion on its quality. That being said, I listened to the album in its entirety and I can at least say I didn't find it boring. I actually kind of enjoyed the more ambient sounding sections as the breaths manipulated into synth pads were a pretty cool element that I thought was well utilized. Anyway, that wraps up my selections for tonight. I'd love to know what you all think of these albums and the stories behind them. If there are any weird or mysterious albums that you'd like to hear me talk about in a future video, please be sure to mention them in the comments below so I can check them out. While you're at it, please give me a like and subscribe to show me your appreciation. You can also support me by giving me a follow on Instagram, TikTok, and Reddit 
credit. I'm always happy to chat music with you all and love receiving any messages or feedback that you have for me. Until next time, thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a lovely rest of your evening. He is the Bubbiest Baby. He is Apollo the Cat. He is the sweetest boy. I say goodnight to Apollo.